I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I was going to say I'm trying to get it up, but I didn't want to say that, but I ended up saying it anyway. Could you once, I mean, could you just one time conduct this live stream in a professional manner? All right. We were covering the, um, the, the biochemist, biologist, molecular biologist. I'm not sure exactly what he was, but we were covering him who left a, a, a very detailed post in the alien subreddit on Reddit yesterday. And, uh, it's pretty com it's pretty compelling, and I know there's a lot of these out there, but everything he's saying is checking out as much as can be checked out. You know, um, people who work in the field are saying this guy's legit. Whether aliens or not, we don't know. Um, but apparently, the aliens have some biotech that um, that would work, that has been tested a little bit. We'll get into that a little a little bit later. Um. But he talked about how he was kind of recruited in. He went through a couple of weird interviews, started talking about how the genetics of the aliens and humans are compatible, although they tried uh, splicing them together. It wouldn't take, thank goodness. But what they did discover is within the alien DNA is um, DNA from not just humans, uh, but animals from Earth. And they were having trouble getting one of the, one of the genetic tests to work. And... Uh, actually use fetal bovine serum as a, uh, I, I believe as a catalyst and it entered a phase of exponential gro uh, growth. We covered the skin, the head, the eyes are weird, the ears, the brain uh, much more advanced than ours. And it looks like it has nodules for some type of, some type of interface. And note, no genitals or anus. I already made the joke. If you go ahead and make it in the chat if you need to. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of this is pointing to that these are clones. So we've got no genitals. We got no no uh, no nipples. No um, no navel. Because why would you need those? All right, we're down to uh, those are like the physical features. Now we are in new information. Now the biological system, starting with the respiratory system. Their cellular respiration is equivalent to ours. They need to oxidize organic components to produce energy. Their lungs have no reciprocating action, but rather have a unidirectional flow of air similar to those seen in birds, which is more efficient than ours. It is speculated that this is in response to the brain's elevated uh, metabolic needs Vocalization is produced by vibration of the wall membrane at the junction between the two air sacs. Wow. So, uh, so no vocal cords. They have um, membranes at a junction between the two air sacs. Is that how? Is that how some birds make sounds? I think it is, right? Where there is like a, like a they have a a bone in there. I forget. Somebody will know. Uh, Eric Stitt, no, no gen nipples. I'm sorry. Good night, Jack Barnes. Pass his bedtime. Pass my bedtime too, but I'm going to give you four hours. All right, the circulatory system of EBOs is rather analogous to ours. The heart is located in the mediastin in the mediastinum, but in, in but in a more medial position, directly beneath the sternum. The heart has two ventricles and two atria. There is an aorta, a pulmonary vein a pulmonary artery, and a vena cava. Blood flowing to the pul pulmonary capillaries by the pulmonary artery is pumped against the flow of air, maximizing gas exchange efficiency. The blood gas barrier is relatively narrow in these capillaries, at least compared to a human. Then oxygen-rich blood is returned to the heart and then expelled into the aorta and to the rest and to the rest of the body. So a little different. The blood itself is also analogous to that of a human. However, the proportion of plasma is much higher. Albumin is in a similar proportion. Hormone levels are much lower. Metal ion levels are much higher, particularly copper. So there's copper again. And glucose levels are significantly higher. The color of the blood is brownish, given the higher proportion of plasma and concentration of metal ions. Um, so higher glucose levels could mean that could because of the big brain also. 
excreto sudoriferous system. Okay, so that's waste and sweat. Because he can't say that. This is how he talks. This system is completely different from what I've seen. As mentioned earlier, there is no large orifice like anus or urethra to get rid of biological waste. Instead, there are countless small pores on the surface of the skin. There's a large medial organ called the hepaterenal organ, which acts as, acts as both kidney and liver and is central to maintaining homeostasis. This organ is highly vascularized and the blood must pass through it before returning to the heart. Its role is, among other things, to purify the blood of, metal of metabolic waste. Waste is excreted into the equivalent of a ureter, which branches out into four. Each branch flows towards one of the four limbs, and in turn, these branches divide until they end up as thousands of excretory pores. The motility of this excretory system is mediated by a weak peristalsis at the proximal level and on the four main branches. Peris peristalsis is the... that's the muscles squeezing stuff along. I know you know that, Gene Williams and Sean Smith, but uh, supercalifragile, isotophobic may not know that. Andrew Kozak knows that. Eric Stitt, maybe not. A peristalsis ceases around the first distal junction. There's no urea cycle. The ammonia concentration at the exit uh, of the hepatorenal organ is very high. Urea is our, that's our PP waste, right? That's ammonia and the other stuff, the minerals or whatever. This ammonia is carried to the pores and gives the distinct odor I mentioned earlier. The rationale, all right, so before he explains what it's for, the odor tracks with a lot of stories like the Virginia incident and others that people are smelling ammonia and intense ammonia. So if you think about it, so if what he's saying is true, there's no, when they ingest food and water, which they don't do a lot of, we'll see, we'll learn that in a second. The waste doesn't get, you know, there's no peas, there's no poops, there's no alien turds or whatever it is. It go, there's a kidney liver combination organ that filters the waste and then distributes it all out to the surface of the body through all these pores. So, if, so you're constantly sweating this ammonia which would just be, ran I mean, that would be so rancid to our, to our nose. It'd be so offensive. You know, you peel that, that synthetic fiber off, what he, he was talking about, that synth synthetic skin, and underneath is just this greasy, sticky, wet, ammonia, alien skin that stinks. So that's gross, but that, that's Virginia incident. They said that Roswell, they talked about the smell as well. So why? Why is it like that? He gets into it a little bit. Um, as there is no urea cycle, the ammonia concentration at the exit, uh, the hepatorenal organ is very high. The ammonia is carried to the pores. It gives a distinct odor. The rationale behind this unusual excretory system is directly related to the excreted ammonia, which enables thermoregulation by evaporating on the skin surface. The greater the physical effort, the greater the metabolism. This in, learn in, in turn leads to a rise in temperature and the corresponding increase to me metabolic waste via amino acid um, catabolism. This leads to an increase in filtration and ammonia excretion, which ultimately, ultimately lowers body temperature. So see how ingenious that is as a system, which it makes the story a little bit more believable because it's either true or it's some really good science fiction writing. Because if you think about mammal waste systems, I guess pretty much every animal waste system, it's kind of, you know, it's it's kind of messy. There's a lot that can go wrong there. It's a it's a process. And um, but with with this physiology, there is none of that. There's no solid waste. There's no and and because there's no organs that do any of that, there's also no infections. There's no there's no cancer. There's none of the things that can go wrong with that, with a very complicated system. Instead, they have one organ filters the waste, gets distributed out to their pores as ammonia, which cools their skin, kind of like how sweat does for us, which suggests that maybe they live in an environment that is warmer, maybe so that, so that, 
they've evolved this mechanism to keep their skin constantly cool because you're constantly excreting waste. And also the more, the more uh, metabolism, so the more effort, the more energy they expend, the higher the metabolism, the more waste comes out of the pores and then the body temperature gets lowered. So that's why he's talking about homeostasis and, um, and thermal regulation through, through an excretion system. That's interesting. So their digestive system is extremely underdeveloped. There's no stomach in a, the familiar sense. However, there's a pseudo stomach located at the transition between the thoracic and abdominal cavities. This organ is not involved in digestion, but only serves as a reservoir. A sphincter controls the flow of blood to the intestine. I know what you're thinking with sphincter, but that, that just means a squeezy muscle. It's not anything naughty. And the intestine is limited to the equivalent of our small intestine. It only serves to absorb liquids and nutrients and acts as the main digestion site. It has villi and microvilli like ours, so little hairs, I guess. Uh, the, intestine, the intestine ends in the hepatorenal organ, so that's that one organ that's the liver and kidney, where non-digested matter is transported to the ureter and excretory system. Um, residues are dissolved in the ammonia and metabolic waste for exc excretion. There's an organ um, that secretes digestive enzymes directly into the, uh, the intestine. So I guess nothing in the mouth, right? No, no, I mean, there's no tongue, so there's no teeth. So not a lot of solid food. Oh, he kind of says that no tongue, no salivary glands. So no, no beginning of the breakdown of food in the mouth. I guess it just goes into this storage cavity. And it starts to get broken down then. Uh, given the absence, oh, he gets into it a little bit here. Given the absence of teeth, the narrowness and rigidity of the esophagus, the absence of a true stomach, and the absence of defecation, it is strongly believed that EBOs can only consume food in liquid form. It is, remember, um, EBO, EBO 1 that Richard Doty talks about? There's the live alien that they captured in 1947. They took to Los Alamos and he lived there until 1940, in 1952. So five years on base. And Doty said, and a couple of people have said, that he could not handle our food. Um, you know, it had to be specially processed. He couldn't eat meat at all. But he did like strawberry ice cream. <laughs> you know, aliens like strawberry ice cream. But with this system, you can understand that. You know, especially if they're from a warm environment, like if their body's warm, so they're constantly cooling it off. Ice cream would be nice and refreshing, and then it melts, and you can digest it. Let's hope that he's not lactose intolerant, because that's a that's alien farts. Uh, so the EBO's liquid form, it's assumed that, given the high met metabolic needs of their brains, this food would have a high carbohydrate concentration. In order to meet other me uh, metabolic needs, there must also be a high protein content in the food consumed. These two statements are supported by the type of enzymes secreted by the digestive organ. It is therefore speculated that the food consumed is a sort of broth rich in sugar and protein, which probably also has high copper content. So something rich in sugar and protein, that would be ice cream, wouldn't it? Uh, pro it probably also has a high copper content. Uh, given the strict limitations on the type of food they can consume, it's unlikely that this type of creature could survive in our biosphere without technological support. And um, there was one story that we did pretty recently where, and maybe it was the the 4chan guy, who says they, they do bring food with them, but it was like this, this little pill or something that they that just, it just dissolved. It was something like that. It wasn't food. It was just a, something they popped and dissolved. All right. Their endocrine system. So endocrine system, that's, uh, that's your glands and stuff, hormone levels, all that stuff. I know, you know, that photo Fox that I'm just saying that for Sheila Davis and Kelly Robinson, you know, they're a little ditzy. So we gotta, we gotta keep, yeah, make sure they can keep up. I see you, Al Bundy. I, I like space food. YouTube is giving me next to no live suggestions tonight. I I don't know this. I don't know if this live stream is recommended all that much. Killer Dad, that's milk and ice cream. They don't put bourbon in it or nothing. Unfortunately, they don't. 
bourbon ice cream. That's a good mix. Endocrine system. Knowledge of the endocrine system is minimal. We know that cells are receptive to bovine growth hormones. So it's assumed that certain functions are regulated by such a system. Endocrine mechanisms are very complex, and it goes without saying that they are best studied on living subjects. So the cells are receptive to bovine growth hormones. All right, I don't think we talked about it earlier, but someone asked about it later. Their, um, their DNA is, rather than kind of strands like ours and double helix, their, theirs is arranged in a kind of a circular structure, like an, o an oval type of structure. which is interesting for, and you'll find out why. All right, their immune system, uh, their immune system is another unknown. There seems to be an innate immune system, but there doesn't seem to be any adaptive immunity, at least not similar to what is known. Um, their thymus is uh, near the hearts larger than humans. This organ seems to be where all blood cells mature. Uh, the, the, the immune cells that germinate here have a high copper concentration. A lot of copper in this biology, and I, I just, I, so fascinated as to why something on their planet, just a ton of copper nervous system. The nervous system is also relatively similar. He means to ours. The spinal cord begins at the base of the central lobe of the brain and propagates down the, uh, uh the, 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 uh, the spinal column in the vertebrae. There are ganglia made of, uh, afferent and efferent neurons. In short, other than the CNS central nervous system, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Musculoskeletal system is very ordinary, albeit underdeveloped. Most of the human skeletal muscles have an equivalent. Only the hands, feet, and forearms are different. It should be noted that the proportion of type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers is different from that in a human. All right, artificial system. We speculate that artificial molecular machines may be present in their bodies, and that copper, if present, would be essential to their function or assembly. Importantly, no AMMs, um, no artificial molecular machines have been observed. So they haven't seen them, but they suspect that they're there. That's his, um, that's his opening story. We have a couple of questions and comments and resp any response from the, uh, from the audience, from the peanut gallery. If you'd like to hear those. Uh, Aunt Lynn online, uh, no Lembus, no Lembus bread in the pockets, but that would be helpful. You could, you could travel so far through the cosmos. If you just had a little bit of that Elvin Lembus bread, uh, Keith Henderson, octopi have copper based blood. Interesting. Bonds beastie tastes like pennies. Yep. Gene Williams bone broth is good for you. It certainly is. All right, so the first question is, um, someone asked this amazing story. Have you shared this with the uh, Senate Select Commission on Intelligence or with Arrow, or do you have evidence to back this up? He says, thanks. No, I haven't, and no, I won't. He said, it sounds like a honey trap to me. I will not place my life in the hands of politicians. This guy's smart. It does sound like a honey trap. I have no proof other than this message. I know it's not much, but it's what I'm prepared to offer. That's fair enough. And look, at, and I'm not going to go through all these um, I'll link to this if you want to read it and drop it in the chat before I forget. I'll link to this if you want to read through all of it, but he never tries to convince anybody and he doesn't even really like you, you'll read some of these where the, the guy will specifically say, look, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just telling you my story. Like it's almost a defensiveness. It's almost like you're overselling that you don't care what we think when you clearly care. This guy is just so he's like, look, this is what I have. This is all I have. And this is all you're getting. Um, question two, well, he, he says, well, that was a read. So they are bioengineered worker bees. And, um, and the response is yes, knowing that they're disposable, unable to live independently without technological support and that they're ephemeral. The only suitable hypothesis is that they are alive only to accomplish their task. Question three is, I haven't read anything in detail, but can you expand, uh, can you expand, expand? on the document on their religion. All right, you wanna hear about their religion now? 
The EBOs believe that the soul is not an extension of the individual, but rather a fundamental characteristic of nature that expresses itself as a field, not unlike gravity. And we've done a couple of episodes that kind of talk about this. Now, the soul is part of this, this just energy that exists. And when you die, it just goes back there. That's what they're describing. So in the presence of life, this field, so this soul field, acquires complexity, resulting in negative entropy, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So, so your, your soul is part of this field of, in nature, like gravity. But when in the presence of life, meaning a new entity, a little piece of that energy comes out and gets a little crazy, gets a little complex, gets kind of individualized, gets a little, that's the entropy he's talking about, gets a little wacky before it comes back to the resting place, the place of peacefulness or whatever, whatever your belief is. Um, this gaining complexity is directly correlated with the concentration of living organisms in a given location. With time and with the right conditions, life in turn becomes more complex until the appearance of sentient life. He's, he's talking about all the planets. He's talking about the, the formula, the process. After reaching this threshold, the field begins to express itself through these sentient beings, forming what we call the soul. Through their life experiences, sentient beings will in turn influence the field in a sort of positive feedback loop. This in turn further accelerates the complexity of the field. Essentially, when the field reaches a critical mass, there will be sort, uh, sort of apotheosis. It's not clear what this means in practical terms, but this quest for apotheosis seems to be the EBO's main motivation. So this tracks with so many religions and so many beliefs, even some spiritual, non-religious spiritual beliefs, that um, some of which I believe is that the soul enters this physical body, lands here in order to accumulate experiences and take those experiences back to the, the global energy, all of our energy. So we're individuals when we're here, we go back, we retain those memories, but we're not really our individual selves anymore. We go back to the, to the whole thing. So the author of this document um, he's talking about this religious document he read. The author of this docu of the document added his reflections and interpretations as an appendix. He specified that for them, the soul field is not a belief, but an obvious truth. He also argues that the soul loses its individuality after death, but that memory and experience persist as part of the field. This fact would influence the philosophy and culture of EBOs, resulting in a society that doesn't fear death, but but which places no importance or reverence on individuality. This belief compels them to seed life, shape it, nurture it, monitor it, and influence it for the ultimate purpose of creating this apotheosis. Paradoxically, they have little or no respect for an individual's well-being. So it's, it's almost like, it's almost like Borg. It's almost like Borg drones where everything is done for the collective, even the, the soul experiences that we have, that they have, are just, it's just a temporary stop. This, this physical life is just a temporary stop to accumulate experiences and bring them back. And when they talk about little or no respect for an individual's well-being, what's mentioned a little bit is abductions and the experiments and some of the the situations and torture that humans have gone through where, where a lot of the abductees talk about how the, how the aliens were not, were, were very cold or very quiet. And there isn't a lot of empathy for their fear or for their pain. And this religion and to them, to the EBOs is not a religion. This is truth. This is just the way it is. It's not like what we believe. This is what happened. This is what it is. It would make sense because they're looking at this being going, what are you whining about? You're going to be dead in a few years, and then you go back where you belong. This is just a temporary thing. Just chill out. You, you, you exist for everyone. What I'd like to know is their, their soul field, their energy field, is that all of ours? I think it implies that it is, that we're all part of this field, us, these aliens. 
people in the chat. We're all part of it. All right, so Mod jumps in and says, as of 1129 hours, the original poster has deleted their account. They refuse to provide verification of their identity and or credentials. So take this right up for what you will. There's no way to verify any of the above, but it does make for an interesting read. I surmise there'll be no further communications or replies in this thread from uh, OP unless they make a new account. Um, edit regarding the issues earlier. The issues he's talking about is this guy kept trying to post this and it got, it was getting auto deleted. He was getting banned, all kinds of weird issues with his account. Um, regarding the issues we initially ran across this post in the auto mod, which caught it due to low karma. Uh, we approved it and re then realized the, the OP's comments were being auto removed. It wasn't till later that we figured out that their account was showing up as shadow banned. He's got a screenshot there. Oh, and there's there's the username, or at least the username he was using. EB, uh, EBO Scientist A. User is shadow banned. A lot of weird things with this. Um, we did make efforts uh, showing up as shadow banned. We did make efforts to engage him. Mail, let me get that for you. Yeah, I, I can't read it either. Looks like you're kind of shadow banned. All right, this this is just the mods basically just wanting to say to the group because there's a lot there's a lot of people in this in this thread. Just want to say, look, we know there's an issue. We, we were trying to fix it. We weren't we weren't banning the guy. Um, this guy asked some technical questions. Genetic scarring, any evidence of similar viral infections or genetic mutations that are detectable across evolutionary timescales? Um, none other than so-called terrestrial gene directly copied. So genetic scarring, so talking about just, just the things that happen to our genetics over millions, billions of years, that as, these, as the mutations happen and through evolution, there will be sometimes tiny remnants of that, small clues of when and where that mutation happened, which is one of the ways that, that we can tell when certain species split off to other species and so forth, as you can see through the genetic scarring. So what this guy's asking is, um, so can we get an idea of, of what does their evolution look like? How, how long is this species of sentient being been around? Whatever, he's, it's a good question. And the response is, there's nothing there. There's just this, so there's nothing there other than the so-called terrestrial gene, terrestrial gene meaning the human, directly copy-pasted into their DNA. Um, the telomeres, how do these organisms age? So telomeres are those, the, just sort of the, fl the f those frayed ends of the, of your DNA strands, right? And as you age, the telomeres get frayed and, and fall off. And that's, and eventually we run out of those and we die, you know, your cells can no longer copy. And it's, and it's the telomeres are the signal to the cells that says we're, we're, we're tired, we're done. But they don't, these creatures don't have telomeres. The chromosomes are circular like a plasmid. So they have no telomeres, which maybe they have a different aging mechanism, but it doesn't look like they would because the genetics and the DNA and everything are so, are so similar that I would guess that it would make sense that there's no telomeres or aging mechanism because they're not designed to age. They're designed to do a task and then then I guess die like a Mr. Meeseeks, just do their thing and go. Mr. Meeseeks, look at me. And a circular, uh, the chromosome is circular like a plasmid. It would be um, an easy way to get genetic cross species genetics going is with circular chromosomes. There's gotta be some biochemists in here that can explain why that is. Jose Mendez, are them biobots? They think uh, this this scientist thinks they might be a little bit. He, they believe that there is some biotech in there. They haven't 
found it yet. Cody Clay, Kirtland brand is not recognized. No, you don't want the Kirtland brand, Mr. Meeseeks. Got to get the original ones. All right, let me see if I highlighted. I highlighted some more stuff here. All right, there's a couple of people just commenting on, you know, the. In, there's some skeptical comments in here because it's it's Reddit, but th he actually wins a couple of people over. You know, if 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 you're LARPing OP, hats off to you. I would read your book. And this guy says, absolutely, this guy could potentially be the next Michael Crichton if this is a LARP. Great hardcore sci-fi. And he says, if he's not LARPing, so if he's not faking this, ooh, brother. Right? This poster says, one thing I find in genuine stories are pieces that make the puzzle make more sense. And he talks about the nodules on the brain that are used to connect with the technology, and that just clicked with me. If this is true, then suddenly the accounts of the people who say the aliens are telepathic suddenly makes more sense. They're not doing magic. They're modified to be able to interface with each other, and maybe that goes to humans too. But since we don't have the receiving end of the technology, it doesn't work too well, just like the witnesses say. I mean, who knows? All I know is that it's now... It's now my head canon. It's now in my head canon for why the aliens are telepathic. Yeah. It makes it start. The pieces start to make a lot of sense. Do the parallel details that keep popping up the deeper you dig on this topic are astonishing. I can't see the highlights with the, with, with the crazy glasses. Uh, the hypothesis they were created before the test. This guy talking about the um, they must therefore be able to me uh, metabolize local organic resources. Would that be the all right? So this guy's ac asking, would that be the fattiest parts of say cattle? So uh, part of the conversation is they metabolize lipids, which are fats, and cattle have lots of that. So this guy's making ha sort of a half a joke, but half asking like, when the, with the cattle mutilations, hey, do they have to be taking out the parts that are extra fatty? Now, I don't know if they are, but that would make sense. Considering their religion, it's obvious now that the greys aren't here to study our biology. They're here to study our interactions with the field so they can better understand it for themselves. And if they are artificial slash drones, then yes, they do the work for someone else can be another biological entity, but we can't exclude interdimensional. What a time to be alive. This is mind blowing. Thanks for sharing. We're coming up on, a, on our hard stop. So I'll just get to a couple of, I mean, that's most of it. I mean, here's here's a, a professional scientist. I drilled this guy with over over twenty technical questions, and I honestly honestly think he's legit. Uh, if it's fake, it's the best LARP I've ever read, uh, bro. You better have a VPN. Government gets a hold of these keywords, you're done. Uh, and that that happened. That happened. Nobody can find this guy. Uh, they have no sense of taste. Yeah, so he said he was going to come back, and he didn't. Instead, his account was deleted. Nobody knows why. And, and he hasn't set up a new account to explain what happened. So that is your, from the late 2000s to mid-2010s, molecular biologist from a, for a national security contractor in a program to study exobiospheric organisms, or EBOs.